It is June 27, 2007. We are in the woods just north of the town of West Yellowstone in South Central Montana. A nearby forest fire severity roadside informs that the fire danger is low. Yes, all vegetation throughout this entire surrounding area appears to be green. As everyone knows, wildfires that spread quickly with high intensity and severity usually occur here in late July or August. But not today. If you are a wildland firefighter, thank you for your service and thank you for watching this. Just as with the Madison Arm Fire, you should now anticipate fire behavior in places and at times that are completely out of character and more severe from what we have known and experienced in the past. The Madison Arm Fire had just been reported. The incident was moving from initial to extended attack. Command and control of this rapidly escalating event was transitioning upward. As a wildland firefighter, such a high-risk environment is your workplace. When incidents are escalating, the fire environment, the fire's size, rate of spread and behavior moves through, rapidly increasing and intensifying changes. Situational awareness, the ability to recognize these changes and interpret and react to them correctly, can break down. During these high tempo times, it is therefore extremely important to ensure that you and your crew's safety always takes top priority. As you are about to see, everyone involved in this incident, from commanders down to firefighters, could have asked more questions and made fewer assumptions. And as you will also see, crew cohesion and trust helped these firefighters survive this potentially fatal event. The Madison Arm Fire is reported at 1 p.m. It is five acres. By 3 p.m., because the fire continues to rapidly spread and grow, a Type 3 incident commander is assigned. At 5 p.m., suppression resources are briefed. Engine A is to patrol the Madison Arm Road and, as the head of the fire moves toward this road, give updates. Engine B's assignment is to stage at the Madison Arm Resort. However, as fire behavior continues to rapidly escalate, new orders are given. Some resources, including Engine B, are directed to regroup at the junction of Route 191 and Madison Arm Road. All of these resources depart on a southerly route around the heel of the fire, except for Engine B. 
This engine and its chase rig take the Madison Arm Road instead. Meanwhile, Engine A reports that the fire is spotting over this road. They are told to try to catch these spots. They immediately request additional assistance. The Engine A supervisor then begins to work the spots. But, because of his growing concern for safety, he orders his crew to remain in the engine. Engine B, now making its way down Madison Arm Road, arrives on scene. By now, the fire's spread has completely cut off the road directly in front of these two engines. Together, Engine B, from this local Forest Service district, and Engine A, from a nearby district, decide that they need to stop chasing these spots, turn around, and leave the area. But the engines then wait for a nearby dozer assigned to the fire to be loaded onto its trailer and for this truck to turn around. After this delay, both engines and Engine B's chase rig, as well as the dozer transport vehicle, all move west along Madison Arm Road. After traveling just a short distance, the head of the fire cuts them off in this direction too. Engine B supervisor is familiar with the area. He knows where a good open clearing, a break in the timber, is located nearby and quickly directs everyone there. Once at this location, the engine crews burn out the fuels between them and the approaching fire. Three minutes after starting this burnout, the winds increase. Intense heat and dense blinding smoke engulfs the firefighters. Everyone is directed to return to and get inside their vehicles, which have already been strategically located to minimize direct fire and heat contact. During the burnover, the heat is intense. Heavy smoke makes breathing difficult. Embers fly past and large chunks of debris rain down on them. Throughout, all of the firefighters stay in their vehicles. Everyone survives the burnover. No one is injured. No vehicles are damaged. Obviously, this favorable outcome could have been much, much worse. After the entrapment, the fire's incident commander said he wished he would have made fewer assumptions and had asked more questions. He wasn't alone, as this fire and its command was swiftly changing, many people on this incident made what turned out to be questionable assumptions. The operations chief said he assumed all suppression resources would take the southerly route, not Madison Arm Road, to the assigned road junction. The dozer boss assumed that the dozer operator would follow instructions to meet at the specified road junction. The dozer operator should not have been there on Madison Arm Road. It is very likely that his delay in turning around led to everyone being entrapped. The engine crew assumed that the dozer was there to assist them with their suppression assignment. In fact, engine A supervisor said he assumed the dozer represented the additional resources that he had requested. This assumption helped delay his eventual decision to depart the area. Engine A supervisor said he felt uneasy about holding the road at the head of the fire but on past fires when he felt unease, the overhead always assured him that he was safe. So despite his inner gut discomfort and apprehension, he therefore assumed that he was in a safe location this time too. As we all now know, he wasn't. The next time this supervisory firefighter is in such an unsafe environment, he says he will immediately take the appropriate actions. As you, and all of us should. All of the entrapped firefighters attribute the positive outcome of this entrapment and burnover to crew cohesion. The firefighters on both engines also say that they completely trusted their supervisor's instincts and direction. Similarly, both engine supervisors say that, without question, they trusted that their crews would carry out their orders. In this case, using their vehicles as a refuge from the firefront worked. However, 
Firefighters should not always depend on a vehicle to survive a fire burnover. In fact, sheltering in vehicles can be extremely dangerous. A firefighter's fire shelter correctly deployed on the ground should always be the first option to be considered. Once again, thank you for watching this. As a wildland firefighter, we hope that these insights from this fire entrapment will help to ensure that such an ordeal never happens to you. Please remember these important lessons learned this fire season and every fire season.